Hello, this is Silvia Mazzoni, and welcome to Open Seas at Home. Today we're going to have some fun learning about Tickle Basics. So, what is Open Seas and why? Well, it's the original still principal interpreter used by Open Seas. It provides a programming platform for Open Seas, and you no longer have to generate Open Seas input manually by doing individual commands, but you can actually program your input file. Simple example, instead of just defining 10 lines of code to define all the different nodal coordinates, you can just write a simple loop where you can loop through your X coordinates and Y coordinates and build your nodal coordinates this way. Tickle is actually only part of a powerful system of language. It's actually Tickle TK. Tickle is the command language part and TK is the graphical user interface. And I will talk about that in the second part of this presentation. Tickle is a very powerful but easy to learn dynamic programming language, which means it's a scripting language. It's suitable for a variety of ranges and uses, and you can actually do web and desktop applications, and it's open source and business friendly. It's been around for a long time, which so what is Tickle for Open Seas? Well, it's a powerful yet simple scripting language, and it's equivalent to MATLAB, but it's free. MATLAB is pretty expensive once you leave the academic world. If you're familiar with Python, you can think it pretty much in parallel in many respects. You just have different syntax. I know both languages. I like Tickle because I'm a lot more familiar with it. Tickle has a string-based command language, which means it evaluates everything as a string, and that if you once you get familiar with that, it can be very powerful. It has variables and variable step substitution, expression evaluation, basic control structures such as if, while, for, and for each loops. It has procedures which are equivalent to functions, which is very handy because you can create shortcuts that create substructures or subcomponents of your OpenSeas input file. It has file manipulation for input and output, and you're able to source, which means to run many different other files. So you can develop your OpenSeas input in different objects. Tickle Basics, uh, the format is as expected, just a command name with a number of arguments. Of course, the number of arguments depend on the command itself. People don't seem to like Tickle at first. I think you just need to get familiar with it enough that you understand why it is the way it is. And once you understand that and accept it, it actually becomes very powerful. People don't like the, what I call pedantic semantics. But for example, if you just wanna set A equal to three, then you have to actually write set A three instead of A equals three, which to me kind of makes a lot more sense. It's almost more conversational than anything else. If you wanna set B equal to A, you actually have to set B dollar sign A. What is that dollar sign? Well, the dollar sign means it's evaluating the value of A. If you set B A with no dollar sign, then B is actually A equal to the letter A. So it's really semantics of it, I think, are very important and make it is what makes it powerful. If you want to set C equal to three times A, you actually have to write this type of expression, set C in bracket expression three times dollar sign A. But once you get over and accept this format, it makes it a lot more powerful. What I really like about it is that variable names can be variables themselves and uh, variable names are case sensitive and can be any length so i really like being able to call my input as it is so it's very easy to document or you almost don't even have to document it you can use variable names such as analysis parameters or static analysis parameters so here's an example like what i showed you before let's say that we want to set a equal to 5 b equal to a of the value of a and then you say putts is almost just a way of echoing. The default is echoing to the screen. So if you were to type putts dollar sign A, it would actually give you the value of A. And if you compute the expression three times A, you have to actually write it out. And if you put it in bracket, it means evaluate what is inside the brackets. One thing is important, which may seem complicated, but actually gives you a choice, is be careful of integer math. If you write expression 5 divided by 2, both of them as integers, it's going to return an integer. If you turn one of them into a decimal or a floating point number, then it will give you the answer in the same format. So it's powerful. I like not having to declare them ahead of time because I always make up variables as I go along. But of course, you then have to be careful. I've just gotten into the habit of always putting a period after a number that I define if I know it's not an integer. So you just pick up these formatting schemes from early on so that you know what you're doing. Just like all 
I hope all programming languages, Tickle has logical statements. Again, just like everything else, you need to learn the format of these statements. Here's a simple example. If A is equal to 2, yes, you have to use the double equal, then B set B equal to 2. So you just have to understand the format that this should actually be a lowercase i, and then anything that's in the brackets is what is checked and the body of the command is within these other brackets. You can also use else if statements and else statements. So very common, just like every other language that it has. You can even write it out simply like this. Once you understand the format, that's really the only difference between Tickle and Python. The source command is a very powerful command because it allows you to have one main file that calls many other subfiles where you may have designed your functions or what we call them as procedures in Tickle. So you can just even within OpenSeas itself, you can then say, okay, source the file name dot Tickle. You can source as many files as you want. You can source a file within another source file. This is how I know whether somebody has inherited my example files is by looking at their file structure and the files that they, they, they have and what they send me. I like to build these individual almost library files where I define my materials, elements, analysis parameters, so that these are just almost boilerplate files that I can take with me wherever I go. And depending on, maybe I have a materials for reinforced concrete, maybe I have materials for steel, and then I can pick from this library that you can build over time, or you can start right away from the examples manual. Um, and that's the whole point of having these your input files broken up into a large number of files. Frank gives me a hard time about it because I typically one input file that has about 27 individual files. In Tickle, a procedure is a user-defined function. You define procedures for repeated series of commands on a fixed set of input variables. A typical application is to create procedure to define fiber sections, and you will see those in the examples manual or procedures to read certain input files or certain ground motion files. What I like to do is I create a library of procedures that I can use on different projects. So if I have a series of commands that I want to repeat, here's the fundamental basic format of a procedure. This is a command. We're going to define a procedure. Here's the name. So define cross section. Uh, you send in a series of input variables. Yes, you can send in optional variables. And then you have a series of commands. So here's a simple example right here where you define a procedure. The input variables are A and B. It computes C as A times B and it returns the answer of C. You can see it's got the dollar sign, so it returns the value of C, not the letter C. And then what you call it is, as shown below, or here's a general format, you call the procedure with the input variables. This parentheses means that you've got a variable number of input variables that is dependent on the procedure name. So here's the example, A is equal to three, set B equal to five, and then you set the results as multiply, and this is your function that you've defined right here, A and B. And it's in brackets telling it, okay, compute this first, and then what the evaluation within these square brackets is goes into the value results. There's two formats that you want to be careful with in Tickle is double quotes and the curly brackets. Variables within the double quotes are evaluated. Variables within the curly brackets are not evaluated. So there's going to be cases where you want to do one or cases you want to do the other. Here's a simple example here. Okay, so set A to blue. So the returns whenever you do this interactively, it's actually the screen here. Shows you how I did interactively, but I'm pasting it here just to make it easier to read. So let's set A equal to blue. So set B equal to red. And it's echoing that that's what it has done. Now I'm making a list. So list one has these two values in there. Because this list has a double quote, the contents of list one are actually blue and red. Now if I do the same command, but I use these curly brackets, and then I ask, okay, what are the contents of list two? It's actually exactly what's in that curly bracket. So it's going to be dollar $A, dollar $B. Sometimes it's really handy because you don't want to evaluate those variables when you define them in the list. You actually want them to stay variable in the list. So now if I say, okay, give me list one, I've got blue, red, give me list two, dollar $A and dollar $B. So if I want to see the first index of list one uh, in Tickle, the first index starts with zero. So the first index of list one is going to be blue, but the first index of list two is actually dollar sign A. 
So it's ready to be evaluated, but it, can, it will only be evaluated when you tell me to evaluate it. So which is exactly here. Now I'm going to say evaluate and put the first index from list one and it's going to be blue. Now I'm going to say evaluate puts the index of list two zero. So it's going to evaluate dollar a. And so it's going to give me the value of blue. Now, if I change the value of a to green, so from here, we're going to go here. Now I'm going to change the value of a to green and I'm going to redo the command evaluate puts L index list one of zero, which is exactly the same command I have here. Okay. Or here, I'm going to get blue for the first one because it already evaluated a early on, but now in list two, I'm having it evaluated once I tell it to evaluate. So I'm going to get green. And so now if I put out the entire list, the two individual lists, one still has the old values of blue and red while the new value are, is seen in list two. So as you develop your programming, you're going to have different cases where you want to do one or the other. So this is a very nice and simple way of, managing simple computations without having to go to procedures. What I often do is I put a bunch of commands in brackets and then I say, okay, evaluate those commands. So what's inside the variable could actually be a whole bunch of lines. There's the while command, which is a command that you can find in many other languages. It's typical, it's just while the expression and body. Please forgive, um, PowerPoint likes to capitalize the first words in a sentence. So here's an example of using the while command. You set the sum equal to zero, you set sum i equal to one, and then I'm gonna say while i is less than 10. So it's checking, is i less than 10? Well, right now i is equal to one. So yes, it's true, it's gonna go ahead and execute to this. So sum is gonna be sum plus i. Now, make sure that you don't get caught in an infinite loop because if you don't change the value of i and run this, this is gonna run forever because one is always gonna be less than 10. But now we're actually saying, okay, increase i by a value of one. So now the value of i is two. Okay, I'm gonna loop. It's gonna keep on looping until i is equal to nine. And then when it hits 10, it actually will not execute what's here. It's gonna pull you out of the while loop and it's gonna give you the answer to the sum. So as I said, be very careful of infinite loops. If you use the while command, first of all, make sure you define it beforehand. Otherwise you're gonna get an error and say, well, what, what is I? And make sure you increment it or change its value so that you don't get stuck in this infinite loop. And as I said, the definition is, if what's in these brackets is false, what's in the body of the command is not gonna get evaluated. The for each command is my favorite because it's the easiest one to compute. You don't have to do a for loop of for i equals one to n. You can actually maybe have a vector called heights, for example, and you may have just individual values, or maybe you have a list of concrete strengths. And so it's a typical for each statement. Most languages have a for each statement. This is the variable that's going to be used inside the for each statement. And this is the list for when it's reading. So it's going to go from the first to the last value here. So it's going to say if this height is equal to three, three, then five, then 10. This is just a typical command. What I like to do, because I program in so many different languages, is I always just Google, okay, example for each command in Tickle, in Python, or in whatever language you're in. But it's just important to understand what the structure looks like and what you can do with it. File input output. Now remember, file input output is what slows down your analysis the most. Like any programming language, Tickle allows files to be open for both reading and writing. Make sure you close them because Windows actually has a limit on the number of files you can have open at the same time. So it's as soon as you're done with a file, make sure you always close it, especially as you loop through your many different input files. So here's on the left a procedure just to compute the factorial. And here's the input. So I'm going to say, okay, open up this temporary file. W means write, R means read. And then it's looping. And here's an example of the for loop. For the very first one, you set i equal to 1. Then you check if i is less than or equal to 10, you will execute the body. And then at the end of that, you're going to increment i by 1. So it's nice to have that all in one line. And it's going to compute the factorial of i for each one and your output file is going to have rows of as many rows as you have here of output. And then make sure, as I said, to always close 
your output file. So how do the OpenSees command go into play? OpenSees commands follow the same format as Tickle, but they're just almost like additional procedures in Tickle that are actually defined within OpenSees. So the OpenSees commands look something like this. Here's the command and here's the arguments, just like in Tickle. And so just because this is OpenSees in the Tickle interpreter, you have variables with a dollar sign in front, which means, okay, evaluate this value here. If you see in the input that it's got a brackets like these, it's actually saying it's an optional variable and it uses the tickle format of the variable name. In your input, you're mainly defining a library of materials, sections, elements, and loads, and input parameters for your different analyses, and you're actually performing computations when you're doing the analyze command. So here's an example of what the OpenSeas input looks like using variables, not just fixed quantities or fixed names or fixed numbers. If you would like to learn more about Tickle, this is the best resource. I always just Google Tickle tutorial and it's gonna take you to their wiki page. I went through this and I highly recommend to going through this. They actually have a lesson plan where you go through each one of these different subsections. What's nice is if you are familiar with one of these sections, you can just skip it and go to the next one. But they're really nicely laid out. And the next step would be to look at examples. Second part of the Tickle TK team is TK, which is my favorite thing in the whole entire world. Uh, TK is a graphical user interface toolkit that takes developing desktop applications to a higher level than conventional approaches. It's a standard GUI. It's not just for Tickle, but it's also used for Python and Perl, if Perl still exists, and other scripting languages. Here's an example of the different widgets that you can build in TK. The frame widget, which is literally a, a container widget. A label where it just has titles. Uh, you can have buttons, check buttons, and radio buttons. You can have user input entries, combo box, which is these list boxes and uh, pull down menus. It's got a scroll bar. It's really cool. You can use it to select numbers. I actually use it for zooming in and out of your graphics. Of course, it's got the text, a progress bar, a scale, and uh, lots of different menu bars that I've used a lot for developing user interfaces. Again, this you can also find through Google, I would just Google Tickle examples or TK examples. Best way to learn about TK is to Google it, Google a tutorial as well as Google examples. And pretty much what I did is I went through each one of these. Maybe as I had ideas, I said, oh, okay, let me look at this example and really learn in detail what I need to do to build my application. And the best way to do it is really to copy these examples, play with them and go from there.